Casa Italiana at Zerili Marimo. We are uh, particularly honored uh, and delighted to have uh, the opportunity to present this uh, new uh, work by Gianfranco Norelli and Suma Kurian, Finding the Mother Load. And uh, tonight we're going to show uh, a shorter version of what is going to be aired on PBS nationwide in mid uh, February in three. Uh, in three uh, uh, days um, and uh, a shorter version whose running time is eight, around 80 minutes and uh, around 7.30 we'll open the floor to your questions to the directors and uh, uh, for those of you but you're all sitting but um, we are going also to arrange for uh, uh, another screening in the library in case uh, more people will uh, arrive um, so enjoy and uh, We'll, um, we'll talk at 7.30. Well, let me break the ice then. Um, you work uh, uh, as a team, so let me start with a personal c c curiosity. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you work? How do you work together? How do you divide the, the, your research? And what, what, who does what? And, and and why? Well, um, we have worked, uh, um, we started with uh, the first film on the Italians in the East Coast, Pane Amaro, when Suma was winding up her uh, experience as, a, as an educator. She was working at uh, CUNY, City University of New York, uh, La Guardia Community College, where she had been working for over 20 years with immigrants, creating programs for them. Uh, language program and, and uh, also training for jobs. And um, I was working, I had left the Italian television, I, had, I started working on my own, and um, I was hoping that Suma would consider this helping me and working in this same field. And um, slowly she started getting interested, and uh, um, when she was still working, we wrote together the script of Pane Amaro. And I saw that we could definitely work together, clearly. <laughs> it's, uh, sometimes it's not an advantage being married no. and working no, together. I know. That's <laughs> <laughs> because basically you wake up in the morning and you talk about work, the first thing that you do. And then you talk about work also before going to bed at night. So That's an additional praise to the documentary that you <laughs> <laughs> Right, yes. Uh, Suma also is very organized and is capable of planning over time. Mm -hmm. I'm um, much more chaotic and I can throw myself into a task and uh, it can go on for who knows how many mm -hmm. hours and, uh, and, and I forget about everything else and there are other deadlines that are coming. Suma remembers those. Suma has a s skill uh, in writing, and, and English is uh, her first language, and uh, I, um, we work together on kind of structuring the stories, and uh, I have uh, uh, experience producing and directing films for about 25 years now, and so this time, because of the small budget we had, we didn't have a lot of choices. We had to do it, only the two of us. And so we bought the equipment and started filming ourselves. And I had some experience filming, so I concentrated more on the filming. Suma concentrated more on asking questions, um, writing the interviews. We selected the characters together. Right. We interviewed over 50 people. And I think we shot about 60 hours of material uh, oh. over three years. So it was a, a long job and because of the small amount of funding we had to go many times and do a little bit each time so this is more or less you know um, I'm obviously not of Italian origin um, but I've done these two um, well I'm from India I, you know I think many people here know um, 
we did both of these films about Italians, um, but I think what strikes one and is how much the Italian story is also the story of other immigrant groups. And one of the things we wanted to explore, particularly in the, in the second film, but also in the first, was about how one lives in what is really a, a multi-ethnic, multicultural society, and how one, you know, people are able to both maintain, and some of them kind of, I mean, you, you, you heard of people wanting to marry others who were 100% whatever, Ligurian, uh, because that was the way that people maintain their culture, others, uh, and there are other instances of, um, you know, like in the case of Sabato Rodia, who was able to um, hold on to his sense of being Italian and his Italian identity and heritage in the midst of a very multi-ethnic, multicultural um, community and be a part of that and build a, a, a nuestro pueblo that, can, that has a place for everybody. And that we thought was a wonderful. And that certainly kind of speaks to me, um, you know, in my work. I mean, this is what I've done all my life. So intellectually, um, it was interesting. And as Gianfranco said, we bring different skills to it. And that was helpful. Um, Questions? Yeah. Question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. That was just wonderful. It brought so many details. Uh, okay, the question about um, what happened during World War II. Um, it would seem that the experience in the south um, of California was not as traumatic as the experience in, the, in, in San Francisco, for instance. But it's still, it's important to kind of remember that the Italian experience during the war was nothing like the Japanese experience during the war, okay? Um, and that's kind of, I mean, you know, in the DVD, we have a little bit more time, we talk a little bit more about the Japanese experience. The Italians um, were enemy aliens for nine months. Uh, the ja and in many cases, the ones who were declared enemy aliens were people who had not become American citizens. In the case of the Japanese, it was 120,000 Japanese who were there in internment camps for the whole period of the war, and most were um, the majority were American citizens. So yes, um, the fact that it, you know, in California there was a particular level of anxiety about, um, the, about the potential for enemy attacks because Hawaii was right next door and there was always the fear that that would happen. So that meant that there was a part of Cal the California coast um, west of Highway 1 that was declared, um, you know, restricted area. A lot of Italian fishermen had to move away. Um, it affected people, but even that kind of, you know, yes, there were some fishermen who were able to continue to be um, as long as they had ID cards. So it, it seemed to have been much less down south. Um, and then you had a comment about, and I let Gianfranco. <laughs> 
Um, yes, we, we, we talk about, uh, well, I wanted to just respond to the point, where did we talk about the effect of the war and the enemy aliens designation and the consequences of that? Uh, we could not, I think we were trying to do both a journey that was geographical to explain different situations, how different communities developed, and at the same time we had to choose characters that had a personal story or who had dedicated many years to the research of certain area. And so certainly San Francisco is the place where the um, consequences of the Second World War are more evident on the community. Uh, but there were uh, other cases in, in Stockton, there were a couple of people who committed suicide because they felt so severely um, discriminated and, and isolated with this enemy alien designation. Um, but I think San Francisco, we chose it to show the fact that about 10,000 people were relocated. Uh, they couldn't, if, if you were an Italian um, who had not become a, an American citizen, you could not leave west of highway, highway one, which would be about five miles or so from the coast. And so some of the people we spoke with went for those seven, eight, and nine months uh, in uh, inland, and they found jobs uh, picking cherries or doing other uh, construction works. And these were fishermen, so they were there was a, a lot of displacement, but it, that, it did not last very long. So the impact is in no way uh, similar to what happened to the Japanese American community. And uh, in both cases, a, a lot of young people, Italians and, and Japanese, went to fight. Uh, you know, in the, in the Second World War, in different fronts, um, but um, still, the 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 I think the stigma continued, and you know, the fact that they could not use the Italian language, uh, that was something that many families continue to remember, and uh, of several families did not really want to talk about that period of their history because it was so painful. No, no, this is the version that will go on the air on PBS. The DVD is the longer version, is the original full film, which is 104 minutes. This is a mini series that PBS wanted to air in different days, and it's three 30 minute films. So it's shorter. So, my actual question is um, the film makes kind of clear that the uh, immigrants, particularly the northern Italian, enjoyed what we would now call uh, white privilege in California, and they were not racialized, except when we get to the narrative of the McLeod lumber strike, where all of a sudden they're clearly being racialized as dagos and segregated. Um, how did that, that come about? Why in this particular instance? I think this is kind of a crucial story in the film, within the story. The fact that the racialization, the discrimination, the racial landscape is very different from one city to another, from one state to another, from one region of this country to another. In Pane Amaro, the first film that we made on the Italian experience in the US, we start with the story of uh, 11 uh, Sicilians who were lynched in New Orleans in 1891. And uh, we talk about the fact that the second largest group, single nationality group, after African Americans, who account for 70% of the lynchings, over 4,000 lynchings officially recorded in this country, 70% uh, were African Americans, 30% were Italian. And then there are other groups. There are Mexicans, uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, Chinese, in this uh, minority of the lynching. So, it's a very complex picture, and it was difficult for us to give an exact um, chronology because in some places things happen in different times. And uh, on the whole, though, the Italians in uh, and the West Coast suffered less of this discrimination than the Italians on the, on the East Coast and the South of the United States. 
There are, however, incidents like the case of the lumberman uh, in, uh, uh, in McLeod, which is north of San Francisco, where clearly the other European uh, um, immigrants who were working, lumbermen in that region, did not want to have anything to do with the Italians. And so they did not want to bunk with them. There was segregation, effectively, of the different workers. And what's interesting is that in the Italian group, there was a further subdivision, if you will, northern Italian and southern Italians. And the um, owners of the McLeod uh, company tried to use this to create a, a difference. And uh, they promised to give that race that they've never had not given yet to the northern uh, workers if they went back to work. And uh, it was very interesting to see that the northern and the southern workers decided to stick together, as they did in several other large strikes, you know, including Patterson, New Jersey, uh, the, the textile workers. So it's all a very complicated patchwork of uh, uh, circumstances that sometimes determine the level of uh, discrimination. There were discriminations against Italians when it came to buy land, to buy, sorry, to buy housing, houses in uh, uh, Los Angeles. That there were these uh, covenants. Uh, and we could not talk about all these examples, but that was an interesting thing that um, Italians were um, in, within a large group of people, different nationalities that could not buy houses in Los Angeles for a long time. So it's a very difficult question to answer. But I don't know. You, have yeah, some other? Um, you know, it, one of the things uh, I, it seems to have, you know, this kind of change in the Italian, uh, the, per the perception of Italians in, as racialized others seems to have happened with increasing numbers of Italian immigrants coming in. So um, the Panama Canal, the, uh, the um, transcontinental railroad bring many more Italian immigrants to the West Coast. And so as the numbers grow, there seems to be a greater sense of fear and uh, about the other. But what is also interesting is at the same time that McLeod is happening, I mean, you know, the same, um, it's also very connected, obviously, to class. So um, the governor um, is socializing with the Sbarbaros and the Janinis and goes and stays with them at the same time that he is calling on the National Guard to be brought in for the first time in the, in the history of this country to put down a strike uh, by the Italians. Um, so that seems to kind of play out a little bit. And what's interesting is that um, as, um, even as, uh, the, I think the Panama Canal is being built, there's a lot of debate about, uh, within California and even among the Italian American elite about whether or not this is a good thing because it's going to bring many more Italian immigrants. And are we going to suddenly be like New York or Chicago or these other cities where there are these all these you know, unskilled wor workers hanging, hanging about. Um, and they basically decide, you know, the, the, the narrative there is, well, Italians are the good, desirable immigrants, unlike the Chinese, who are the uh, undesirable. Um, and in fact, you know, at, in the Italian Swiss colony, um, the, the statutes of the company ban Chinese from working there. Only Italians could work um, at the Italian Swiss colony. Yeah, so there was, uh, it's a complicated story. Yeah, I guess one last uh, comment is the fact that really you can determine the positions of the, of, of the Italians in this racial landscape in relation to other groups. So that in California, there were other large groups of workers who occupied the lower rung in society, the Chinese and the Mexicans. And therefore, Italians arrived, are embraced so to speak, by the uh, mainstream white immigrants as a different group. They, 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 they find space for them. But it, the, the, the division becomes very clear when it comes to the other groups. And the Chinese and the Mexicans were the, the most obvious difference. In the 
in the East Coast, there isn't such a situation in which there are large, especially in the, in the East Coast, in the north of the United States, there are no large groups of African Americans at that time. And therefore, the Italians fit in the space that the Irish had found a generation or two earlier, and it's the, 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 the bottom of the social pyramid for, a, for a quite a long time. Uh, uh, bravo, and congratulations for that marvelous uh, documentary. My only regret was it was an hour longer. Um, I would maintain that the success of the Italian uh, communities in parts of California uh, owe, you know, in part to their solidarity, but their separatist attitude. They dealt with each other, yeah, yeah. a common language. Um, I was surprised you didn't mention more about Fogazi and Giannini. I mean, after all, they bankrolled even at the motion picture industry. That is true. Yeah. That is true. And we had to, uh, there were so many other subjects that we could have expanded on, but the time limitation was really the problem. So I'll pick the first, you take the yeah, second. Yeah. OK. Um, um, regarding uh, why we chose this particular region to focus the second film, I think it, it has to be seen in the context of the previous work as well. We wanted to see it was a very different experience in the West Coast than it was in the East, and we try and highlight the points. Regarding uh, to the question of why we first were interested in making this film, um, Suma and I went go every year to Italy. We've been married 20 years and uh, we go uh, often. We have a lot of friends still there. I came after university, so I have a lot of friends. I was an adult already when I left Italy, and so I have a lot of friends with whom I maintain contact. And uh, when we went to Italy, more and more we, we were shocked by the fact that Italians are so ill-equipped, it would seem, to deal with immigrants themselves. The immigrants who arrive in Italy are discriminated, are seen as this invasion, whereas without them, the economy of Italy, which is already in very bad shape, would practically collapse in a few days. So we were shocked by how it was possible this uh, amnesia uh, you know, every Italian family has at least a few members who emigrated. There are, it's calculated, maybe about 90 million people of Italian origin who are in uh, all over the world, from Chile to Australia, you know, from Canada to New Zealand, and all over Europe. And still, having lived the experience of emigra emigra emigrating, uh, Italians seem to not really remember any of that. And uh, the discrimination against immigrants today is something that shocked us. No, no, I'm saying that Italians in Italy are now uh, the destination. Italy is the destination. Well, so I think they never really have a real grasp of what it was that people went through here. Because all the people wrote letters that were quite romanticized. So 
Yeah, but there is an effort now, especially on the part of uh, younger scholars, filmmakers. Uh, so I think that there is an effort to um, inform the Italian public about this. And we made the first film for the Italian national television, Rai, and it went on the air nationally on prime time. So it, I think there is some curiosity. We don't know because the Italian television uh, budget seems to be the very unlikely to, to, to manage to buy more documentaries. But uh, you're very welcome. I, I leave you with the other question. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, um, you know, wh one of the reasons we made this film was because California struck us as being such a different experience from the East Coast experience. When we first showed Panemaro in California, and we, you know, we didn't know the California story as California's it Italian story is not the story, the, it, the Italian immigrant narrative that comes to mind most readily. I mean, it, we think about the East Coast and the, uh, the, the urban settings of the East and the South, uh, and the cent and Central, and yeah, and Chicago, for instance, the Midwest, in, in talking about the Italian immigrant experience. So when we went to California, people pointed out to us, you know, great film, this is not our story. And so we began to kind of, you know, we became curious about, what made it made for that different story? I mean, what were the conditions that allowed Italians to have a different story there? And you know, as we've been talking about the racial landscape, and that was a very important part of it. Obviously, the the timing of their arrival in California was an important part of it because they arrived at a time when California was still wide open. Um, you know, when larger numbers of Italians be, immigrants began to come had already become a place where there wasn't the same amount of opportunity. Uh, so people were seen as being as more threatening, um, I think, um, to go back to the second question that you had. There wasn't the same level, from what we can tell, of um, labor activism among Italians in California as there was on the East Coast. Um, one, they were not working in, in in large industrial settings. I mean, so there wasn't the same kind of, and many of them were entrepreneurs working on their own, working out in, you know, farmers, fishermen, that kind of thing. Um, in fact, one of the scholars we spoke to um, talked about how when there was, you know, in labor activity among the cannery workers in places like Monterey, the Italians generally kind of stayed away from uh, th from involvement in those because they saw themselves as on their way out of the working class. I mean, they had access to becoming owners and boat owners and cannery owners. They saw that possibility partly because they were part of the white fold in a way that the Latinos, Mexicans were not, or the uh, Chinese were not, and they were the ones who were more than um, involved in labor act activities in the 30s in California. One of the, one of the elements that uh, became evident comparing Panamaro to the second installment of your work is the emergence of uh, female figures, many more female figures that we have seen in the yes. first first movie. Can you talk about that and say if it's something that you uh, find yourself to be true, or is this just incidental? Um. I think this is again something else. I mean, I was much more involved in the creation of this film than, than in the earlier film, so I guess I wanted to make sure that the women were much more central. Um, but also, I think there has been quite a bit of research about what the West made possible for all women, uh, because I think in the, the West made possible for women a much more um, active role uh, fewer conventions, perhaps. I mean, they were out often, you know, living um, on the frontier as pioneers, and that was certainly true for the Italian women as well. Um, you know, though here too, I mean, I think there's been some research now um, that talks about the Italian women's involvement in the labor movement, uh, for example. I mean, I think that's beginning to happen. Um, you know, Jennifer Guillermo has done some work in that. Um, but anyway, I mean, um, 
in the earlier film, which was made, as Gianfranco said, prime, first for Rai Italian television, we did actually say we wanted to include, you know, a look at the Italian women. Um, they didn't kind of get that. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, oh, I have one other question. I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm not Italian, and I actually didn't know that there was such a large Italian presence in California. So, thank you very much. And uh, uh, which brings up a question. If Italians were there since the middle of the 19th century, but yet there is absolutely no presence of Italians in in the film industry, short of Bruno Valentino. So how did that happen? <laughs> Well, uh, I think, well, we, certainly we have Capra early on. We've shown some images here of the, that banquet. That was the first film that Frank Capra shot, and it was uh, in the uh, 20s. He was a young man. Um, I, I think you're, you're right, uh, but we have to look at the fact that there were um, in the beginning of, of Hollywood, uh, the image of uh, the main actor and main actress had to conform to certain uh, um, ideas of beauty and being attractive. And at that time, they tended to be more Anglo looking. I don't think that there were a lot of uh, um, non Anglo looking stars at the beginning of Hollywood. I would say, what do you? I think there is just also the question that uh, it would fall into those fifty-eight hours of stuff that you probably left yeah. on the on the floor. That you you just can't put everything, yeah. and and because there's actually more than even Capra and Valentino, and uh, I was actually surprised of how much stuff you were able to to squeeze in. You, there's even a, a fleeting image of that great inscription by and the first, um, the first two lines of Dante's Paradiso on the church of St. Peter's and Paul, you know? La gloria di colui che tutto, let me, I'm a literary scholar, then I'm, I'm finishing a Dante book. So. Uh, La gloria di colui che tutto muove per l'universo penetra e risplende. And when you see that in front of the Pacific, uh, you know, it's like, Wow, we've arrived in paradise. That's 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 what they're saying, you know. We've arrived at the beginning of paradise, so that's very very strong. And you even managed to to put that in. So uh, you just uh, as a last maybe, uh, curiosity to wrap all this up. What what do you regret the most having having had to leave behind on the floor on the in the editing room? What is uh, something that you, you reluctantly? You chose not to put. I wish we had been able to talk a little bit more about racial identities. Um, you know, in fact, I mean, at some point people said, you know, you can't, you cannot be talking so much about, you know, earlier versions we talked about the Chinese and the Japanese and the racial landscape quite a bit more. And the feeling was we needed to really stay more focused on the Italians. And also for people, you know, for a larger audience, there was only so much we could do with the North and the South. I mean, you had to do so much, much more of an explanation for what, um, for a, a public that may not understand those um, intricacies of kind of intra-Italian racism. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing. <laughs>